just do some more reading. Why UFOs? Operation Trojan Horse, John A. Keel. Uh, skip the quote there. Uh, we're on chapter 11. Are you endangering the balance of the universe? An Air Force plane spiraled clumsily out of the sullen Argentine sky and crashed near Kilino uh, in August of 1957, setting the stage for one of hundreds of ridiculous contact stories that have been appearing in newspapers throughout the world for the past 20 years. Now remember, this book was written 50 years ago, and even though it was written 50 years ago, it's still applicable today. Um, the Argentine Air Force dispatch dispatched three men to the site to guard the wreck until proper equipment could be mustered to haul it back to the base. On the evening, uh, uh, of August the 20th, 1957, two of the men went into the town for supplies while the third lounged in their tent. Suddenly, according to his story, he heard an eerie high-pitched hum. He stepped outside of the tent and was astonished to see a huge luminous metal disc hovering directly overhead. In horror, he reached for his pistol, but could not seem to draw it from his holster for some unknown reason, he claimed later. Standing transfixed, tugging helplessly at his gun, the young man heard a soft-spoken voice coming from the humming object. It addressed him gently in his own language and told him not to be afraid. Then it went on to tell him that the disk was an interplanetary spacecraft and that the base for such craft wa had been stalled, installed in a nearby province of Salta, an area where UFO sightings have been reported constantly for the past 15 years. UFO Alley. We intended to help you, the voice is supposed to have declared for the misuse of atomic energy threatens to destroy you." And a quote. The voice went on to say that the very, very soon the rest of the world would know about the flying saucers. Then the bushes and the trees began to rustle and the craft ascended straight up and disappeared. The young, young Argentinian was so upset by the experience that he reported it in full to his commanding officer, later reported it in full to his commanding officer. Excuse me, later he took his most seriously, he took him most seriously and passed the story on to one of the Argentinian's largest and most respected newspapers, uh, Dario Argentina, no, Dario de Cordoba, Cordoba. okay, sorry about this which carried the full account two days later. Even though the U.S. Air Force and various civilian groups struggled to discount and discredit the contact, the stories, huh, I don't know what the hell's going on now, I thought I just borrowed it. See if it just pops up. Okay, sorry about all that. They continue to turn up. Let's make sure we're on the right page. Context to contact these stories. They continue to turn up everywhere. Many of them contain such ludicrous details that they are easy to dismiss until you realize that the same ludicrous details are appearing in Italy, Brazil, Sweden, Africa, the Soviet Union, Australia, and nearly every other country on earth. 
consider the improbable tale told by movie actor Stuart Whiteman, star of those magnificent men in their flying machines and many other big budget films. According to Mr. Whitman, he was trapped in his 12th floor suite in a fashionable New York hotel during the big blackout of November 1965 when he heard a sound like a, a whirl a whip poor whippoorwill whippoorwill uh, okay uh, whistling outside his window he looked out and saw two luminous disc shaped objects one blue and the other orange <clears throat> I film a lot of these orange and blue ones at least that's what he later told Hollywood columnist of Vernon Scott. Then he heard a voice which sounded as if it were coming from a loudspeaker. Quote, they said they had they were fearful of earth, end quote. Whitman explained because the earthlings were messing around with unknown quantities and might disrupt the balance of the universe or their planet. Da -da -da. The blackout was just a little demonstration of their power, and they could do a lot more with almost no effort. They said they could uh, stop our whole planet from functioning. And <clears throat> I imagine that is true. Might be true. In this Fortean uh, eh, nightmare that we live in, no one else in the crowded streets of. of darkened in New York reported seeing these objects and no one apparently heard that loudspeaker but Whitman sticks to a story why is anybody why is anybody's guess he certainly doesn't need publicity at least not that kind of publicity uh, Senhor Helio Agu I don't know how to pronounce these names Agu Agre Aguirre Aguirre Agrier uh, didn't seem to be looking for publicity either when he spun his straight story to Brazilian journalist uh, Joe, Joe, Joe Martins <clears throat> in 1959. A 32-year-old statistician, statistician employed by a bank in Bahá'í Brazil Agura, uh, not only claimed to have received a message from a UFO, but he took a series of startling pictures to back up the story. While riding a motorcycle near a place called uh, Payata, um, a on April 24, 1959, Senor Agura uh, says. He observed a silvery disk with a number of windows visible uh, on the dome of the top. The underside of the object bore three markings or symbols which were actually faintly visible in the original originals of his pictures, but unfortunately don't r reproduce well. Agarar stopped his motorcycle Un unlimbered his camp his camera and took three quick shots as the object performed leisurely movements overhead you know I had when I saw mine in a uh, UFO which it turns out to be uh, in February during that time period when they were having these supposed that shooting these these UFO stones right like over Lake Michigan I live in the border of Michigan Ohio but closer to I'm like 12 miles from Lake Erie, and um, <clears throat> I mean, it was so oh, I'll never forget it. I mean, it lit up the top of the trees and the top of the roofs of the house of the houses in my neighborhood. And uh, when I went out to try to take a picture of it, because I saw it from my, my kitchen window, 
and being slow that I am because um, the MS when I finally got outside I was able to get just a little bit of some of it and um, when I tried to film the orange ball or orb or whatever the hell it was uh, floating across the sky going eastward or over my place I couldn't film it I tried to film it a couple times but it would not register on my camera but I saw it with my naked eyes I don't know what to say except that's what happened so that's the reason why I'm interested in this because I you know I've read and heard from other people who have experience with uh, Sasquatch and investigating Sasquatch that this does happen and lo and behold, I had one <laughs> go right over my place. I first saw it in my kitchen window. And my kitchen window, so I never keep, I don't have any blinds anymore, so I can see what's outside. Um, at one time, I was so f freaked out from my experiences with my encounters with Bigfoot, I, I, I was, uh, uh, I did have blinds, but I took them all down and said, I'm not afraid anymore. So it has been a couple of years like that, so. Anyways, back to this reading. Okay, the underside of the object bore three markings or symbols which were actually faintly visible in the originals uh, of his pictures, but unfortunately do not reproduce well. Uh, uh, Agurar, I don't know if I pronounced the name right. I don't know, people, I'm sorry. Stopped his motorcycle, unlimited his camera, and took three quick shots of the object. Uh, and performed leisurely movements overhead. And then, according to Gordon Creighton's translation of the photograph's original testimony, photograph photographer's original testimony, he began to feel a pressure in his brain. Oh, yeah. And uh, a state of progressive confusion overtook him. It's so funny that they said that because my second encounter with Bigfoot, I ended up having terrible headaches and neck aches for like a month, month and a half until it eventually subsided. <clears throat> it was a bad, this second encounter, um, um, I don't know, it was something pretending to be Sasquatch or what, but it, uh, that shit came home. And when I saw that that looked like Sasquatch. It's pierced. And it's it's you know burnt in my brain. Um, it was in my backyard, and it gets even stranger than that. He felt vaguely as though he was being ordered by someone to write something down. It was as though he were being hypnotized, as he was uh, uh, winding the film on before proceeding to take a fourth picture, he lost all sense of what was happening. Like the prophet Daniel and Joseph Smith of the Mormons, Senhor, Senhor Agar, Agar uh, passed out. And the next time he, he knew, he, was stum he stumbled over his motorcycle and the UFO was gone. But clutched in his hands was a, a piece of paper bearing a message in his own handwriting put an absolute stop to all atomic tests for warlike purposes the message warned the balance of the universe is threatened we shall remain vigilant and ready if to intervene well maybe that's one of the reason why they have done one or let you know dropped one in another country that be the United States and what oh my god I'm saying so, you know it's what were we at 55 75 almost 80 years it's 87 years or 77 years <clears throat> the balance of the universe in quotes it's a very odd coincidence how this same phrase turns up over and over again in stories of these kooks and crackpots. Two years before Senhor Agar's uh, alleged communication from the UFOs 
a quiet gentleman in England claimed that he had been taken for a ride. His name was James Cook of Runcor uh, Cheshire, Cheshire, and he stated that he saw a strange luminous object in the sky at 2.15 a.m. on the morning of September uh, 1957. While he watched in frustration, the object changed colors from blue to white, then blue again, and finally to a dark red. I mean, I film things that are dark red that look like orbs. I film things that are blue and white and turquoise and um, I never seen any green ones. The yellowish green ones seem to be um, artifacts from lights. <coughs> but I filmed a lot of ones in the sky. Like tonight I went out again to a couple locations just in my area and f filmed some stuff that are very bright, bright in the air, just like you would see film if, if uh, the lamp, a uh, street lamp, or uh, a porch light, or something like that. And like, hmm. Like it's exhibiting uh, or emitting a lot of electricity. Like it's electrical in nature. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know shit. The more I do this, the more I realize I don't know crap about anything. While he watched in fr fascination, the object changed colors from blue to white, then blue again, and finally a dark red. It hurtled out of the sky. It, it hurtled out of the sky and settled to the ground only a few feet from him. And then he claimed a voice addressed him, inviting him aboard. A ladder descended from the craft, and the voice instructed him, jump onto the ladder. Don't step onto it. The ground is damp. <clears throat> huh. Well, if they asked me to do that, I couldn't do that. He obeyed and leaped onto the bottom rung of the, of the ladder and climbed into an empty chamber illuminated by dazzling, dazzling light from from some unseen source. The voice told him to take off his clothes and put on the, the plastic-like coveralls which were in the chamber. Again, he did as he was told. After he had changed his clothes, he asked to to leave the blah, blah, blah. And it says here under here, it says, the summer 1963 comedian Red Skelton was laughing alone on a beach in California when according to what he later told reporter Dick Kleiner uh, newspaper enterprise associates uh, he leaped into a semi trance um, lapsed into a semi trance for about an hour upon recovering full consciousness he discovered a terrifying message written in his own hand and the, the notebook he always carries with him. He doesn't remember writing it or even thinking the words. The message was President Kennedy will be killed in November. <clears throat> Didn't know that. God knows. God knows, right? If there is a is God. Uh, the craft or entered a, a another one that had landed nearby uh, so and there he said he found 20 people all of them much taller than he was and they took him for a ride in into outer space <clears throat> they told him that they were from the planet called Zomadok Zomdik Zomdik? I guess Zomdik which was another solar system and was unknown to our scientists. Their craft could not operate in damp weather. They had allegedly explained to him apparently because they were surrounded by some kind of electrified field. They also told him, he said, that the saucers were used only in the vicinity of the earth and could not operate in outer space. 
Well, I thought he just moved outer space. Okay, with it. Okay. <clears throat> the inhabitants of our, your planet will upset the balance if they persist in using force instead of harmony. Mr. Cook asserts that he was told warn them of the danger. So it doesn't make much sense. Why should why don't they like you know when the Congress is in session they show up then that's that would make more sense <clears throat> you know what I mean or Parliament or you know what I mean it doesn't make sense I mean nobody will listen to me he says he protested or anyone else either one of the giant spacemen snapped Mr. Cook was disappointed, dis deposited several hours later, in the very spot where he had first been picked up. He related his story to the authorities and then quickly returned to his garden in the English countryside. Like the majority of all known contactees, he didn't, did not write any books or go on any lecture tours. Zomdick was never heard from again either. Mrs. Thelma Roberts of Britain's Flying Saucer Review interviewed Mr. Cook and he showed her a burn on his back of his left hand and told her he had received it when he had left the saucer and had failed to remove his hand from the ladder's railing before his feet touched the wet ground. <clears throat> Another contactee who has refused to make any fuss over his purported experience with the people from outer space is a young Italian engineer named Lucene Luceno uh, it's okay. Lucano Galli, I guess that's how you pronounce it, who runs a small company on the outskirts of Rome. His story is far more unbelievable than Mr. Cook's, but whether you believe it or not, it contains all the classic elements which appear in many similar y yarns. The, these elements include terrestrials, people just like you and, uh, and me, who are in some way connected with the UFO phenomena. Or maybe they really are our ultra terrestrials in disguise. Signor Galle, Signor Galle, excuse me, left his home after lunch on July 7, 1957, and was headed back to his plant when a black fiat pulled up and a tall, dark-skinned man with piercing jet black eyes spoke to him. Do you remember me? The man asked Galli. Uh, I get I had seen the man before on the streets of Rome and for some reason had felt like speaking to him but had but he did disappeared into the crowds. I remember you, Gali said, replied. Would you like to come with us? The man asked. Where to? Have confidence, the man smiled. Nothing will happen to you. Gali impulsively got into the car, and another man, smaller with delicate features, was driving. Um, they uh, proceeded to the uh, Crora, Crora Ridge, I don't know if that I'm saying it right, outside of Rome, where Galley says a saucer shaped machine was waiting for them. A cylinder dropped down uh, from the center of the underside of the craft, and a door opened in it. The tall, dark man led Galley into it, and they rose into the interior where two bright lights suddenly flashed. Don't be afraid, the stranger laughed. We have just taken your picture. There, why, why would you, okay. There was a window-like lens about a yard in diameter in the bottom of the craft, and Galley said, 
and through it he could see the earth fall away as they shut upward. Within minutes they were in space and they where they approached a gigantic cigar shaped object which Galley estimated to be at least 600 meters almost 2,000 feet long. A very bright light surrounded one end of it and there were a series of ports through which a number of saucers could be seen entering and leaving. <clears throat> this is one of our spaceships, the stranger explained. They flew into one of the open ports and when Galley left the saucer he found himself in a huge chamber. There were, he said, no less than four or five hundred people there standing and walking around. Okay. He was given a tour of the ship and was shown a large library, lounges and control rooms and the commander's quarters. Less than four hours later he was back on the ridge outside of Rome. He kept his story to himself and did not really talk about it until a reporter who had heard rumors tracked him down in 1962. I don't care what anybody says, Galley declared. The story is true. You can believe you can believe it if you wish. There were scores of contactees, contactee reports uh, during the 12 months 1957, maybe even hundreds. Uh, there are now lost to us. One of the most notable of these involved a prominent Brazilian lawyer, Professor. Is, I don't know how to pronounce this. Is J O D uh, Fretas? Fretas? I don't know. Uh, um, Gomeris, Gomeris, a sober middle aged military advocate in Seo Sebastio. <laughs> I don't know if saying this is right. He said that he went joyriding in a flying saucer on a cool you think I might learn some of that my but that's my ex-wife was Maria uh, uh, Natursia Maria Godino that was her name maiden name then she Walsh and then Adams it's kind of funny uh, uh, evening evening and uh, so cool evening in July of 1957 for a long time afterward, he kept his experience to himself, sharing it with only a few friends, such as Sao Paulo, um, Sao pa Paulo, Judge Dr. Alberto Franco. I could have said I can sp pronounce that. <laughs> uh, on a dull, overcast evening, uh, Guy 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 Mares recalled. He was walking alone along the beach off the coast of Belo Island, Brazil, when he saw a jet of water rise up. Then a pot-bellied machine surfaced and moved toward shore. To his astonishment, two men, both more than 5'10 inches tall, with long fair hair, uh, wearing tight-fitting green coveralls clambered out, he said. They approached him directly and s s uh, slightly indicated, silently indicated that they would like him to step aboard. He spoke to them in French, English, and Italian, and Portuguese. Okay. Since they didn't seem hostile and since he was overcome with curiosity, he accepted their unspoken invitation, climbed up a long ladder mounted outside the craft with help of two men stepped into the object. The ladder was retracted and the door eased shut. And the professor remained in a small compartment next to a window. He could not say later how many compartments there were in the craft. As the machine lifted into the air he was surprised to see water splashing against the portholes. It is raining, he asked. 
or is it raining, he asks. He claims that he received a silent reply. He felt it was some kind of telepathy, although he admitted it knowing nothing about such matters. Somehow his hosts told him that the water was caused by the rotation of the craft. Hmm. For the next 40 minutes or so, he said, he watched watch stop his watch stop during the flight the now identified the now identified to him flying objects uh, flitted about in the starlit upper atmosphere during the trip he noted that he left he felt pain and cold cold in his genitals he tried to ask the men where they were from, but they did not not answer. One of them showed him a chart, something like a zodiac, he said, and he had the feeling that they were trying to explain when, he, when they would return, and that they wanted him to meet them again. Finally, they delivered him back to the spot where they had picked him up and six months later he told the story to a friend Dr. Lincoln uh, Filicano who, uh, who contacted the, a Brazilian journalist Professor uh, uh, Guamares uh, quickly became a celebrity of sorts in Brazil and was, he confessed, amazed by the grave respect the story was accord. In John Fuller's account of the bizarre UFO contact of a Barney and Betty Hill interrupted journey, Barney Hill recalled upper, recalled under hypnosis that he was placed on a table aboard the flying saucer that he felt something cold being lowered over his genitals. The Hills watched also stopped during their uh, alleged experience. The most famous contactee of, nine, of 1956 through 57 was a New Jersey sign painter named Howard Menger. He was discovered by Long John Nebel a New York radio personality who conducted an all-night talk show over station WOR. He is now on NBC. Long John had just begun his career in the radio and he was looking for an angle. He found it in flying saucers and built a huge following with his offbeat interviews with contactees, mystics, and assorted weirdos. <laughs> Somehow, he has managed to remain detached and claims to this day that he doesn't buy most of what his guests tell him. In any case, Minger's initial appearance on Long John's show started a stampede to the little town of High Bridge, New Jersey. Minger's home, according to Howard Minger, uh, the flying saucers were frequently landing on his property and the the UFO knots um, uh, often dropped in for coffee. Minger, a gentleman, a soft-spoken man uh, with a sincere manner, claimed that he had first been contacted by long-haired blonde men in automobiles back in his army days in World War II. And in June 1946, a gl glowing UFO had landed near his parents' home in Highbridge, and, and two men and a beautiful girl had stepped out. The men were dressed in blue-gray ski uh, uh, or sky-type uniforms. Ski-type uniform, excuse me, where where the where blonde, fair-skinned, and of medium height. 
The woman, he said, the woman, he said, wore a similar outfit of a soft plastic color which almost seemed to glow. She told him she was 500 years old. Basically, she advised him to learn to use his mental powers and prepare for the important days ahead. She also is supposed to have told him to keep his mouth shut about all this until 1957. So he waited, and in 1957, the UFOs began to come to Highbridge. He, they were seen by many. There were even several witnesses who claimed they had stood by and watched as Howard went out to meet and chat with the space people. Menger's book, From Out, Outer Space to You, tells uh, an even more bizarre story than George Adamski's, Adamski's. He relates frequent visits with apparent terrestrials who introduced him into the unbelievable underworld of the silent contactees, ordinary men and women who seemed exceptionally knowledgeable about the UFO situation and who posed as businessmen, real estate dealers, and the like. He was, he said, called out in the middle of the night to take long trips to desolate landing areas. On one occasion, he was allegedly instructed to buy a box of sunglasses and leave them in an isolated field at night. He, his book is filled with strange stories, most of them completely unpalatable to the UFO researchers who were seeking hardware and solid evidence that the UFOs were from outer space, stories that hinted of occultism, telepathy, uh, extrasensory perception, and as always a simplified philosophy based upon the golden rule. Although there is some religious commentaries in the book, Menger seems obsessed with the health with health foods and offered diet information which presumably had some relation to what he was learning from the UFO, UFO nuts. The last 63 pages are devoted to a treatise entitled A New Concept in Nutrition. Sandwiches and between the landing and contacts, which he tells in a direct and convincing manner. Sandwiched in between, okay. Manger relates things like how a Sergeant uh, Kramer in the village of Bedminster, New Jersey, had uh, pursued a speeding light light green station wagon bearing a license plate number WRE 79 79 whatever Mager had once owned such a vehicle and with that license plate number he was hauled into court to answer the charges he had actually been nowhere near Bedminster on the night in question and Sergeant Kramer's testimony as quoted by Minger, was most unusual. Kramer told the judge that he had pursued the station wagon to a red light at an intersection where a uh, simply where it simply disappeared. Since the visibility at that particular intersection was good in all directions for some distance, it's a mystery how the car could have been one that Menger, Menger had junked years before. Well, what do we have around here? A phantom car, the judge re allegedly remarked. I feel like either putting a man in jail for perjury or breaking a sergeant. This is the strangest case I have heard in all my years on the bench. The good judge didn't know half of it. One of Menger's 
terrestrial contactees, excuse me, contacts, and is supposed to have told him, my friend, this earth is the battlefield of Armageddon. Well, if you read the Bible properly, Armageddon already happened like 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> the battle is for men's minds and souls. There is a very powerful group on this planet which possesses tremendous knowledge of technology, psychology, and the most unfortunate of all, advanced brain therapy. They use people not only for this planet, but people from Mars as well, and also other people of your own planet, people who you don't know about, people who live unobserved and undiscovered as yet. The Minger book, Minger book was published by Gray Barker in 1959 and enjoyed a small sale of a few thousand. The UFO hardcore at the time was no more than 30,000 and if the UFO book partic particularly a contacted book sold 3,000 copies it was practically the be a bestseller. Mangers didn't stop with the, the book. He issued a photograph rec record which he claimed contains music composed by the, the space people but it sounded more like Howard Manger plucking clumsily at a badly tuned piano. Then came the freakish climate which was almost as fantastic as all that had gone on before. At one of his early broadcasts with Long John, a crowd had gathered in front of the studio, and in it there was a striking blonde girl named Marla. She and Minger met, and he later divorced his wife so he could marry her. Marla, Howard confided to friends, was from another planet. Marla's real name was Constance Weber. Marla was her space name, she explained, and was the pseudonym which appears in her book, My Saturn, Satur, Saturian Lover. Her Saturian was Howard. For, you see, the space people informed him that he was originally from the planet Saturn. In early 1960, Long John Nebels uh, landed a television show. It was a, a natural that he should invite Howard Mingers to be one of his first guests. Mingers was certain to be controversial, articulate, and enthralling. All or so producer uh, Pateris Flem, Flemund, Mons, Flemons thought. On the night of the show, according to Mr. Fle Flemons, an unusual, quiet, and nervous Howard Meggers walked into the studio. I know that his natural manner could be boyish and even shy. Flemons uh, commented later, but on this particular occasion he j just seemed vague. Long John sensed this, too, and broke his usual rule of never speaking to a guest before going on the air. Let's not do the show now, Long John will admonish. Let's wait until we're on air. He said a few kidding words to his old friend, and then the red lights blinked on and millions of viewers around Northeast settled back to hear Howard Maker tell about his experiences with the friendly brothers from outer space. Instead, Flemons recalls vaguely, aimlessly rather, embarrassingly, he avoided and vacillated. How Howard Menger, Saturian husband to a Venetian traveler in... <laughs> space, friend of extraterrestrials, a, not a notator 
of authentic music from another planet, master of te teleportation and sociological, uh, sociological sage uh, extraordinaire recanted, denied almost everything. His saucers might have been psychic. His space people visions and his and Marla's other planethood metaphoric. As a matter of fact, so did he retreat from his tale of the unreal. The reality of the immediate surroundings seemed to fade momentarily. If he had excluded a sort of a trans, translucent identity in God my friend a translucent indefiniteness when he arrived he was close to invisible when he left to this day the transition of the myth and personality of Howard Menger remains one of the most captivating enigmas of the contact ology later in a letter to Gray Bank Parkers and Saucer News editor Jim Mosley Menger termed his book fiction fact and implied that the Pentagon had given him the films and asked him to participate in an experiment to test the public's reaction to extraterrestrial contact. He has helped us, therefore, to dismiss his entire story as not only a hoax, but a hoax perpetrated by the U.S. government. Mosley staged a circus-like congress of science fiction ufologists in New York in 1967 and flew Howard and Marla up uh, from their current home in Florida. Howard and Jim reasoned would it be a strong drawing card for a, a, the far-out French. I met Mangers briefly backstage the day he spoke to some 1,500 people gathered at the Congress. Long John introduced him from the stage. Menger was still shy and boyish. His palms were covered in, with sweat. Although he had given many lectures and appeared frequently on radio and television, his nerves were visibly raw and an afternoon that afternoon, here I thought to myself, is a very scared man. His brief lecture was a bitter disappointment to the little old ladies who had come to hear the message of hope and faith. His retraction on the Long John show a few years earlier was forgotten and he made a conscious effort to please the crowd of believers by sticking to a positive pro-extraterrestrial line. He avoided discussing the CIA's alleged experiment and his own misgivings about the reality of UFOs. Instead, he talked about the saucer he was trying to build in his basement, permanently from plans given to him by you-know-who. Then he spent several minutes knocking the National Investigation Committee on Aer Aerial Phenomena and its Deputy Director Richard Hall for their attempts to thwart his plans for a UFO convention in Florida and finally he got around to his controversial contacts. I think the most important thing that happened to me he said was a high at was in Highbridge, New Jersey, in the summer of 1956. It was in August. The craft came down from the west. It looked like a huge fireball. I was frightened. Gradually, it came closer. It slowed down. The pulsation subsided. The metallic appearance was plainly visible. A metallic uh, appearance was plainly uh, visible. It was no longer a ball of fire. It turned into what looked like a man-made craft. 
of reflecting the sun as it came close to the ground. It was a beautiful sight, very similar to the one on the screen here. He was showing a UFO movie. It stopped about a foot and a half from the ground and open, opening appeared in the side of the craft. There was a small incline and a platform. Two men stepped out, very nicely dressed in shiny space shoot suits such a, as what we have today for our astronauts. Very similar, of course. In those days, this was way ahead of the, of the time. A man stepped to the left and the other stepped to the right. Then another man stepped out. A man I will never forget as long as I live. He was approximately six foot one, maybe six foot two. He had long blonde hair over his shoulders. Yes, young, long blonde hair. He stepped toward me and the message he gave, of course, was what most people don't want to hear. A message of love and understanding. He said he had come from outer space, which is what most people really don't believe in. Someday they will. I often wonder what would happen to these people who say, well, what proof do you have? If I could see a flying saucer or someone step out of a craft, boy, I would make sure the people knew about it. Well, I just wonder about that. If you realize what people go through when this happens to them, if you really think you have guts enough to come up and tell people, of course, nowadays it might be a little easier, but in the early 50s it was very, very rough, especially when you are in business and you are trying to act like a reputable citizen and bring up a family. You know things like this in your community. Yes, it must have been rough. It must have been it must have required more than just a little guts for Howard Minger to first come forward with such a story and then later publicly recant on television. I have talked with several different people who were around High Bridge in 1957, 56, 57. One of them is Ivan T. Sanders, who lived nearby, who knew Howard before, during, and after these episodes. Something strange was definitely happening to Menger and the people around him in that time. Did Howard Mengers get rich from all this? On the contrary, he lost his sign painting business and his reputation. In the end, he had to flee to another state where he is just barely eking out a living at his old trade. Howard Menger is not alone. There are many other tormented victims in this incredible drama. One of them was a traveling grain buyer named uh, Reinhold Schmidt. Schmidt? 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 Later on the afternoon of November 5, 1957, Schmidt uh, entered the office of Sheriff David Drag in Kearney, uh, Nebraska and unfolded a tale of contact that was classical in every detail. He said his engine had stalled out of, of Kearney and went, when he got out of his car to check it, he saw a silver blimp in a nearby field. Curious, he walked towards it and was surprised when a, a kind of staircase opened up and unreeled towards him. A man in a conventional terrestrial clothes stepped out to meet him, speaking in perfect German, a language which Schmidt understood. Or Schmidt, I don't know how you pronounce Schmidt. Schmidt. Repairs were being made, the man explained Schmidt, 
was w well welcome to look around until the work was completed. Schmidt said there were four people aboard, two men, two women, all apparently normal except one bewilder bewildering detail. They did not seem to walk, he noted. Rather, they seemed to glide across the floor of the craft as if they were on casters. He described glowing tubes of colored liquids inside the craft, but overall it, w it was a stark, as stark and as simple as the interiors described by other contactees. F the four people were not very informative as usual, but told Smite that he would know all about it. Them eventually and them eventually. The whole episode sounds very much like <clears throat> the chance encounters reported by the ninth the 1897 contactees. After, after, but after, after about 30 minutes, Schneid was asked to leave. And the repairs were finished. The object took off, and now excited grain buyer headed for Kearney. Within 24 hours, the authorities had him locked up in a nearby mental institution for observation. The Air Force. Air Force officers materialized and bra braided, <clears throat> branded the poor man as a nut. A search of the alleged landing site revealed puddles of purple liquid so common at, at such spots all over the world. And there were indentations in the ground where the object stood. But when the sheriff searched Smith's car, he found an open can of oil in, in the trunk and accused him of having spread it around the site. Schmidt did, Smite, or I guess Schmidt, Schmidt, I don't know why I can't say the name, Schmidt, uh, not only denied ownership of the can, but pointed out reasonably that it would be rather foolish to drive around with an open oil can in the back of any car. Later, after he was released, Smite, uh, or Schmidt lectured widely and howled loud and long about the treatment he had received. Ufologists noted that his story improved with age and new embellishments were added each time he told it. Apparently, he claimed other contacts of some sort and revealed that he knew the location of a wonderful quartz mine in California. The space people had told him that this quartz would cure cancer. He started to raise money to mine the quartz and eventually some of his investors hauled him into court where he, he was indicted for as a swindler. Thus, Reinhold Schmidt, Schmidt join the unhappy ranks of the contactees. A thoroughly discredited man, yet his original story made as much sense as any other contactee. Story. He seemed to experience many of the same problems reported by the other pawns in this ultra-terrestrial game. There were repeated contacts and manipulations which convinced him of the apparent validity of the UFO. Uf, Uf, uh, knots, the UFO knots claims and led him down uh, the long road to total disaster. Massive flaps, a massive flap condition existed throughout the world during the weeks of Smith's unfortunate encounter and there were a number of other contacts, all groups within 36 hours of Smith's. Some of these uh, contacts produced details which tended to corroborate with others. Uh, <clears throat> on October 4th, 1957, a Soviet 
the Soviet hurled the first man-made satellite into space, it was now visible to the naked eye. A month later, on November 3, 1957, Sputnik 2 carried an l- ill-fated Russian dog, Leiko. Lake Leiko. Leiko. I guess it's <clears throat> into orbit. Three days after that, and uh, at 6:30 a.m. on the morning, of November 6, a 20-year-old farm boy, Everett Clark of uh, Dante, Dante uh, Tennessee, got up to let out his dog Frisky, and was non-pulsed to see. Un- I guess non-pulse to see a strange glowing object uh, resting in the field about 300 feet from the house. Thinking that he was dreaming, young Clark shuffled back to bed. A few minutes later, he returned to the door to call his dog, and he saw that the object was still there. Several of the neighborhood dogs, Frisky included, were clustered around it, barking at four people, two men and two women, all normally dressed and who were moving around outside the oblong thing. One of the men, Clark later told reporters and investigators from the Aerial Phenomenal Research Organization, was trying to grab Frisky, but the dog <coughs> growled and backed away. And I need to take my medicine. So. Okay, I'll start at the beginning of this page again. He said that these people were talking in a guttural tongue, which sounded like the German soldiers he had seen in the movies. The man did catch one of the other dogs, but it snarled and snapped at him, and he let it go. Then the strange... uh, Quartet turned and seemed to walk right through the walls of the craft, like walking through glass. Clark said one of these men had seen the boy watching them and had made a motion for him to approach, but Clark declined. Don't take Texas lies outside of Knoxville and is a long, long way from Kearney, Nebraska. Smith story of the day before did not appear in the area until after Everett Clark had made his initial report. Reporter Carson Brewer of Knoxville News Sentinel found an elongated impression in the field where the grass had been pressed down in an area 24 feet by 5 feet. A PRO's investigators found that Clark was regarded as a serious and honest boy by his high school principal and his grandma said he had called her immediately after the incident. His parents had already gone to work and that he was hysterical. Later, that very night, another farmer, John uh, Tresco of Everettstown, New Jersey, reportedly went outside to feed his dog, King, when he saw a brightly glowing egg-shaped object hovering above the ground near his barn. A weird little man stepped timidly towards him. He said he was about three and a half feet tall and had a putty-colored face hmm, with large bulging frog-like eyes and was dressed in green coveralls. We are a, a peaceful people. Uh, Tresco recorded the quoted the little man as saying in a high, scary voice, "He, we don't want no trouble. We just want your dog." <laughs> uh, taken aback, farmer said he managed to snap. Get the hell out of here. 
the little man scurried back to the object, it shot off into the evening sky. On Wednesday night, November 6th, true to Wednesday phenomenon pattern, there were the landings in uh, Mount, Montville, uh, Ohio, Dante, Texas, Everettstown, New Jersey. Another weird contact took place near Paya del Rey, um, California. Paya del Rey, Paya del Rey, California. When three cars stalled along the highway called Vista del Mar, the drivers, Richard Kehoe, Ronald Burks, and Joe Thomas, got out to see what was wrong. The answer seemed to lie in the egg-shaped machine sitting on a nearby beach surrounded by a blue haze. Two men apparently came from the object and spoke to the trio in, in difficult to understand English. Probably it sounded like me. <laughs> According to Kyo, the men were about five feet five inches tall dressed in black leather trousers and light colored jerseys their skin he said appeared to be yellowish green <clears throat> they asked some very ordinary questions Kyo uh, reported such as what time is it who were we where were we where were we going and so on uh, chalk up a still another apparently meaningless contact after the men flew off and their strange machine the motors were able to get the motors were able to get the car started again a final contact was reported that morning by a truck driver named uh, Melvin Stevens he said he was driving near house Mississippi about 7.25 a.m. when a large egg-shaped object dropped out of the sky and landed on the highway directly in front of him. Stevens, a 48-year-old resident of Dryersburg, Mississippi, said that he thought at first it was some kind of weather balloon. Then he noticed that there seemed to be a propeller on either end and on top of the object. He got out of his truck and was confronted by three people, two men and a woman, all about four and a half feet tall with pasty white faces. They were dressed, he said, in gray suits and they tried to talk to him in a rapid fire language which he could not understand. One of them tried to shake his hand. After a few minutes of futile attempts uh, conversation, the beings got back into their object and flew off. Stevens later told some of his co-workers about the episode and one of them passed it on to the uh, Mer Meridian, Meridian Research Organization excuse me, the Meridian Mississippi he passed it on to the Meridian Mississippi Star. Later, when the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization investigated, they found him to be highly regarded as a reliable family man and not one to make up tales or play practical jokes. The, high, the big picture for 1957 is, an awesome, is awesome in scope. There were apparently reliable contact reports earlier in the year from South America, Professor uh, Guameris uh, in Brazil early in July, uh, Senor Gale in Italy. Also early in July, the Argentine Air Force Guard in August, on August 20th, Mr. Cook of England on September 7, and remember, both Cook and the Argentine airmen claimed that they had been warned about our upsetting the balance of the universe. Cook had never heard of the Argentine report. 
that preceded his alleged experience by about only three weeks. The Argentine arm airman said that the voice told him that flying saucers would soon be showing themselves all over the world. That prediction certainly came true in November of 1957. <clears throat> the contactee hoax. I have now met and interviewed in depth more than 200 silent contactees who, unlike most of those already named, have never publicly revealed their experiences. They do not write books or go on lecture tours. They show little or no interest in UFO literature. Some of them begin to experience personal personality deterioration after their initial contact. Others find their previously normal lives disrupted by nightmares and peculiar hallucinations. Poltergeists, noisy, invisible ghosts invade their homes. Their telephones and TV sets uh, run amok. My own educated guess is that there may be 50,000 or more silent candidates in the United States alone. A new one and new ones are being added to the list every month. Nevertheless, a complex and frightening hoax is involved in all this, but it is not the product of run-of-the-mill practical jokers, liars, and lunatics. Quite frankly, many of these contactees lack the imagination to make up their stories or to construct the complicated hoaxes which develop. They are well-meaning, honest people who have undergone an experience which seems very real to them. In case after case, such people are able to come up with details which correlate and which have received little or no publicity. This would be absolutely impossible if they were simply making up their stories. No, the real truth lies in another direction. The contactees from 1897 on have been telling us what they were told by the UF, UFO knots. The, the UFO knots are the liars, not the contactees. They are lying deliberately as part of a bewildering smokescreen which they have established to cover their origin, purpose, and motivation. In recent years, we have been informed by seemingly sincere contactees, several of whom have undergone psychiatric and lie detector tests and passed them with flying colors, that the saucers come from unknown planets named uh, uh, a clarion, a uh, master, a uh, scar, uh, blah, uh, blah, blue, blue, uh, I guess they bleed blue, uh, Tinthin, um, Corandor, Orion, Fowser, uh, Zo Zomdic, uh, uh, Anstria, and a dozen other absurd places. They have also been contactees who talk freely about the people of Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, and the Moon. The chances are excellent that the UFOs don't come from any of these places, any more than the great airships of 1897 came from a secret lab in Nebraska. These names are planets, not are, these names are plants, not planets. Whatever the UFOs are up to, they are doing it on a very large scale all over the Earth, and it inevitably, and it is ne inevitable that they should come into contact with some of us from time to time, either accidentally or by design. When such contacts do occur, they deliberately hand out ridiculous false information. They exploit our beliefs, hide safely behind the limited credulity of our scientists and government. 
credulity, okay, the limited credulity of our scientists and governments. It is time that we got wise to the simple psychological trick. They've been pulling it on us for centuries. Can we really blame the contactees? Suppose the strange metallic disc cover with flashing lights, colored lights, settle in your backyard and a tall man in a one-piece silver space suit got out. Suppose he looked unlike any man you had ever seen before and when you asked him where he was from he replied I'm from Venus. Would you argue with him? Chances are you would accept his word for it and if he des you decided to tell the world the news you would naturally proclaim that the mystery has been solved. The flying saucers were from Venus. You were certain because this very sincere stranger had told you so. Buried within the contact of all the con con buried in the context of all the contactees' messages, are uh, there are clues to an even more complex threat. A direct threat to us. Each contactee has been able to pass on a small fragment of real truth. The endless descriptions of peaceful far-off worlds and shiny cities of glass are only subterfuge. Because I can extend this further, I must, before I send this any further, I must present you with some of the other evidence. You must be aware of all the pieces of the puzzle before they can fall into place and make sense. Already you can understand why so many people have been in total confusion for so long. This whole mystery has been designed to keep us confused and skeptical. Somebody somewhere is having a good laugh at our expense. That's the end of chapter 11. Chapter 11 is What is Your Time Cycle? Of the book Why UFOs Operation Trojan Horse by John A. Keel. It was written some 50 years ago. Is it 50 years ago? Yeah, it's 53 years ago, right? Almost 54 years ago, maybe. Anyways, 